My name is Jamie Blair. My name is Jacob White. I'm a carbon fibre fabricator. My name is Adam Waterhouse and I'm one of the mechanical engineers here at Roden Cars. So my name's Daniel, Daniel Pugh. My name's Matt Purdy. I'm a mechanical engineer here at Roden Cars. Uh, my name is Daniel and I'm a machinist. I'm Courtney from Roden Cars. I am in charge of the purchasing and logistics and I'd like to thank everybody for submitting their questions on our LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram pages for our Ask an Engineer section. Matt Reggers on Facebook would like to know, what is your process in setting up your suspension geometry? How do you conclude on values for KPI, cast, caster, camber, curve, etc.? There are many aspects of the suspension geometry and you can get very locked into them and it can become quite confusing. And the key is to understand the concepts, know they exist, start from a basis that has worked on previous cars and um, then work from there. So make sure things are adjustable and then get out there and actually operate the car and learn what affects that car. Every chassis is different, the dynamics of what those components do to the car are generally the same and you need to just work with those principles and move from there. We know the general values that work and then we get on the track and we look at the tyre temperature, the tyre wear, and we just adjust our setup to suit. What are the most crucial aspects of tyre data you investigate to assist in suspension geometry decisions? Generally tyre temperature and wear is enough to learn a fair bit about what is happening. There is a lot you can get involved in, um, but if you start with the, the big components that will solve 90% of the problems or teach you 90% of the solution, then that's a great start. Carl Davidson wants to know, do you still have oxidation on titanium parts as seen in the UC FSAE parts? Have you trialled any other alloys? Or are you interested in alloy development for your supercar? No, we don't. That was one situation where we didn't have the specific type of furnace that you need to prevent that colouring. That colouring is, as you said, oxidisation, and that just means there's oxygen present when you are heat treating the components. When we did those parts for the FSAE team, um, we just simply didn't have the furnace at the time and that was the best result that could be achieved in the vicinity. Um, and so no, we have moved on from there and those parts weren't affected by it, it was just a byproduct. We are interested in other materials, we're generally looking for the best material for the application and David is always very driven by that. Um, that is also dictated by the machines and, the, and what you can actually work with, what's available. Um, and so yes, we are interested and we just move with what we can obtain. Daniel McAuley would like to know what materials and processes do you use to make plugs and moulds for all of your composites? At Roden Cars, we don't like to limit ourselves to any one particular method or type of material to produce our moulds. We like to stay open-minded and always innovating. Steve Riley on Facebook wants to know if carbotanium was available outside of the Medina design pattern or is it a viable material for these cars? Anything's a viable material for the cars, if it's appropriate. Um, we look into a range of materials and whatever is appropriate for the situation we are interested in and we develop from there. Question from Scott Parker. He wants to know what is the largest section you can CNC or print for body panels? We have a printer that can print um, 650 by 750 by 550. Uh, that's a resin printer. Um, that's the total volume, so you wouldn't actually fill that up with a part. Um, and for machining, we have a table router that can do uh, 1300 by 2.5 by 150. Our mill is a limited size, the largest mill we've got, so UMC 750 Haas. Um, and the largest printer we've got for printing any moulds is a SLA um, Pro X800 from 3D Systems and that pretty much limits the dimensions of the parts. The suspension lab would like to know what do you use for aero development? Do you have your own wind tunnel? No, we do not have a wind tunnel. We've got the real deal. We have a racing track and we have cars. Um, a wind tunnel is necessary when you have neither. So we learn a lot from just using the car, looking at what the tyres are doing, understanding from whoever has been driving the car what they've felt and developing the car from there. Have NSX on Instagram wants to know, will the DAS filter down other cars? Is tow worth changing on the fly? DAS or dual axis steering would be something we would potentially look at on a car, um, but we really have to compare this to the benefits we get from it for the added complexity. I think it would filter down to other cars, and yes, tow is worth changing on the fly. How much do you actually gain from doing it? There's, you know, there's a, there's a range of effects there. Formula One, they're all, you know, using very similar cars and operating right at the limit. Um, on a general road car, you're going to see, you know, a range from zero to something. 
Um, yes, it is worth changing. It just depends on the gains that you're actually looking for. Blair Dixon on LinkedIn wants to know, where's a good place to learn about designing and manufacturing carbon fiber parts? Carbon fiber is a bit of a black art and there's no real qualification for carbon fiber fabrication. So I think YouTube's an awesome place to start. Cleanliness, so just being clean, um, contamination, you don't want any of that. Very, very much it's all about eye for detail and just making sure your fiber's hard in the mold, there's no bridging. You're just developing how to laminate properly, working from the inside out. And say don't skip the dry fiber, wet laminate, resin infusion. Those processes are paramount to get nailed down before you get onto pre-preg. Great question from 1977 Papi Chulo. They would like to know if the GPV8 is a crate engine from Cosworth that we plug in and play, or have we made any engineering improvements for our specific needs? Essentially it is like a crate engine that comes complete from Cosworth having been dyno tested. However, the GPV8 was, I believe, well, I understand, developed specifically for the T125 and Lotus from their XG engine. So it has been tailored specifically for this application. Um, the ECU we're using is a Pectel SQ6M, I believe it's called. A good one from, as you may see, 3333. They would like to know, when will the company introduce a new powertrain to match the current F1 cars? We don't want to match the current F1 cars. We want to produce our own engine with a real sound and real power and everything like that. And so we are looking at producing hybrid vehicles in the future, but right now we're focused on our twin turbo V10. Wayne would like to know, is it all Cosworth Electronics as well as the engine? A lot of it is Cosworth Electronics or Pectel. Um, the ECU, the data log are some of the main components, but we also do use other uh, brands where appropriate. Jim wants to know, what are the three biggest changes you made from the Lotus T125 to make the car more practical to use? The car is not practical to produce. <laughs> um, we want to make an exotic car with exotic materials and it not just be a car, but also a piece of art. And so, our goal is to not produce them practically, but pr to produce the best car that we can. And so we use titanium printing, we're low volume um, parts, and we're trying to be high quality parts. And so those sort of um, manufacturing techniques are perfectly suited to it. A lot of the changes were made is be more to do things in house or in, within New Zealand, and that's made it more practical for us to develop to be the best it can be. So the top three things or three main things for that is Probably titanium printing bracketry and stuff like that. Um, design and manufacture of our wiring looms and perhaps some of the in-house carbon work. These things allow us the development cycle to happen quickly and to develop the car to be the best it can be. Gary Morton on Facebook would like to know, when will your new motor be ready to test? It will be ready when it's ready. There is a, it's a long process and we're developing a lot of parts on it. Um, none of this is off-the-shelf componentry and there is a lot involved with that, but we are aiming for the end of this year. Daniel would like to know what is the time and cost to develop the V10 for the Roden FZ, specifically to get it on the road for emissions compliance? Well, we've already been working on it for longer than I wanted to and spent more money than I wanted to. So, all development takes too long and costs too much money. And the engine that we're working on is designed to be able to go to the road, but to be honest, we haven't really even looked at the emission side of it yet because that's a fair way down the track. There's a lot of time and money that has to go into developing your own engine. There's years so far of um, involvement in this engine. Nothing is off the shelf. This is all bespoke parts to create the most compact and small V10 that we can.